So for this lecture, we will jump right into cutaneous T-cell lymphomas. So T-cell lymphomas is a difficult group of diseases. You really have to look at the clinical, the histopathologic presentation, and the progression, as well as the timeline of response to treatment to be able to gather the best picture of what is going on with the patient. So here's a list. I won't read through them because we will cover them, but there are a lot of different entities and you really have to understand what you're looking for, not only clinically, but also on pathology to be able to make the diagnosis. At the end of the day, it can be very tricky to make a diagnosis if you don't have multiple time points and multiple data points to be able to put together clinical progression and behavior. So that's a major drawback to making the diagnosis initially with just one time point. So you really have to look at the big picture over time. So here's an algorithm for classification of cutaneous T-cell lymphomas. You can see the more common to the more rare listed from top to bottom. 65% of CTCLs are composed of mycosis fungoides and variants and Cesare syndrome. 25% of CTCLs include the spectrum of cutaneous CD30 positive lymphoproliferative disorders, including lymphomatoid papulosis, which occur in recurrent waxing and waning ulcerative nodules and crops of lesions that come and go, and cutaneous anaplastic large cell lymphoma, which does not come and go, and in fact, persists and clinically progresses. 10% of CTCLs include other types, including non-MF, non cesare non syndrome, and non-CD30 lymphoproliferative disorders. These include entities like adult T-cell leukemia lymphoma, subcutaneous paniculitis-like T-cell lymphoma, extranodal NK T-cell lymphoma nasal type, aggressive epidermotropic CD8-positive CTCL, cutaneous gamma-delta T-cell lymphoma, cutaneous CD4-positive small-medium T-cell lymphoproliferative disorder, primary cutaneous acral CD8-positive T-cell lymphoma, and peripheral T-cell lymphoma, not otherwise specified. Many of these charts and algorithms are pulled from the most recent edition of the Bologna textbook. So here is the WHO EORTC classification for cutaneous T-cell lymphomas. You can see the more indolent clinically behaving entities on the top half and on the lower half, you have the more aggressive clinical behaving. Mycosis fungoides represents about half of the MF cases or the CTCL cases rather, and has a pretty good five-year survival rate of 88%. There are other variants of mycosis fungoides, including folliculotropic MF, pagetoid reticulosis, and granulomatous slack skin, which we will show examples of. Moving into the primary cutaneous CD30 positive lymphoproliferative disorders, including CALCL and LYP, which we mentioned, which also have a pretty good five-year survival rate. Subcutaneous paniculitis like T-cell lymphoma has a survival rate of above 80% over five years, but it is very rare with a frequency of less than 1% of all CTCLs. The primary cutaneous CD4 positive small medium T-cell lymphoproliferative disorder represents also a very small percentage of 3% and has of the indolent behaving entities 75%, which is on the lower end of the indolent behaving entities in terms of the survival rate. Primary cutaneous acral CD8 positive T cell lymphoma is probably the most rare of these entities compared to, I guess the only other comp uh, competitor would be granulomatous slack skin. And primary cutaneous acral CD8 positive T cell lymphoma actually has a 100% five-year survival rate based on the data. Moving on to the aggressive clinically behaving entities, Cesare syndrome represents a small percentage of cases at 4%, but has a 24% five-year survival rate. Adult T-cell leukemia and lymphoma, we don't have enough data on it, but it is um, more aggressive. Extranodal NK T-cell lymphoma nasal type, unfortunately has less than 5% survival rate. Primary cutaneous CD8 
positive aggressive epidermotropic cytotoxic T cell lymphoma represents less than 1% of cases, but has an 18% five-year survival rate. Primary cutaneous gamma delta T cell lymphoma has less than a 5% survival rate over five years. And primary cutaneous peripheral T cell lymphoma, not otherwise specified, is kind of a catch-all if it doesn't fit into these other boxes. And this represents 3% approximately and has equally as low survival rate as 16%. So what's the differential diagnosis of the common histologic patterns in CTCL? I know these are a lot of charts, but it's useful to organize your framework of thinking before going into the clinical and the histology. So the histologic category you can think about as epidermotropic CTCL. So this is simulating or consistent with plaque stage MF. These include MF, and what you're going to see are character characteristic patches and plaques and most atypical cells are within the epidermis. However, when you progress from patch to plaque to nodular stage, you'll start to have more of the dermal infiltration as opposed to just epidermal presence of these atypical cells. Pagetoid reticulosis represents a solitary plaque and most commonly on the distal extremities with neoplastic cells combined to usually an acanthotic epidermis and the phenotype on these are usually CD8 positive. You can see some CD30 expression. Now, when we talk about CD30 expression, you should be thinking of lymphomatoid papulosis. Lymphomatoid papulosis, particularly types B and D show epidermotropic architecture. Now, if you hear lymphomatoid papulosis, you should definitely be thinking about recurrent self-healing papular eruptions clinically. Sometimes these can extend to the infiltrate in the lower dermis. And in some cases, you might have admixture with large atypical cells, as in type A LYP. Type D LYP is usually CD8 rich. And we'll go over the types of LYP. Primary cutaneous CD8 positive aggressive epidermotropic cytotoxic T cell lymphoma consists of infiltrated plaques, but often eruptive nodules and tumors with ulceration. You'll see intraepidermal accumulation of medium-sized pleomorphic T cells or small blast-like cells, no typical cerebriform appearance, however. And the phenotype of this entity is usually obviously in the name CD8 positive, but with other cytotoxic markers such as TIA1, granzyme B, CD45RA, and it may or may not retain CD7. Cesare syndrome, which I want to reiterate is a leukemia, that can involve the skin. So it's, it's thought that Cesare syndrome and classic mycosis fungoides represent different entities because usually Cesare syndrome is a leukemic or blood involvement form of a clonal T cell population. Typically, these are more of a central T cell phenotype as opposed to the peripheral effector T cell phenotype that you usually see in mycosis fungoides. So in Cesare syndrome, you often see erythroderma clinically, as well as lymph node involvement and peripheral blood involvement. Histologically, if it involves the skin, you're going to see more of a monotonous infiltrate. And preferably, you're going to see the same exact T-cell clone in the skin and the blood. So again, think of this as a leukemia that involves the skin. An adult T-cell leukemia and lymphoma is clinically and histologically identical to MF. However, it's more associated with the HTLV-1 virus status in patients from endemic areas. And we will cover this. How about CTCL with diffuse pleomorphic infiltrates that are CD30 negative? So you can think about tumor stage MF. You'll see concurrent patches and plaques along with the tumors. You'll see variable numbers of small, medium-sized, or large cerebriform T cells and or blast cells in a variable admixture with inflammatory cells, including eosinophils, which I've seen some cases recently that have been very eosinophilic rich, and don't let that throw you off as, as it did me when I first looked at the punch biopsy of a recent case. So you can see a lot of eosinophils in tumor stage MF, not in all cases, but in some cases, it can be very striking amount of eosinophils.
Primary cutaneous peripheral T cell lymphoma not otherwise specified. It's also indistinguishable from MF with blastic transformation, uh, no prior or concurrent patches or plaques. And how about this primary cutaneous CD4 positive small medium T cell lymphoproliferative disorder, also known as nodular pseudo T cell lymphoma. If you're going to think of a marker that's practically used in this case, you'll think of PD-1 or program death one uh, protein. However, this is not as a severe uh, condition such as tumor stage MF. This is rather limited. And so it presents as solitary plaques or tumors about two to three centimeters with no prior concurrent patches or plaques. Again, you'll see scattered medium sized to large pleomorphic T cells, less than 30% of the cells, which express PD-1. There are many admixed CD8 positive T cells, B cells, and histiocytes. No aberrant phenotype, meaning no marker loss. And you can see clonal T cell population in most cases. So this is an entity because you can see a clonal proliferation of these CD4 positive cells, but it does not behave as aggressively as other types of cutaneous T cell lymphomas. Looking at the CD30 positive CTCLs, as I mentioned, lymphomatoid papulosis and the types you should think about being more consistently CD30 positive are types A, C, D, and E. B can be negative, but it can be positive. But if you had to list a, an LYP that can be CD30 negative, it would be type B. So what characterizes lymphomatoid papulosis? Recurrent self-healing -heal papules and nodules on a histologic spectrum from typical LYP to identical um, CALCL. So anaplastic large cell lymphoma can look identical to lymphomatoid papulosis, especially type C. And you really need to know the clinical progression. So based on the biopsy alone, it may be impossible to say, is it LYP type C? Is it cutaneous anaplastic large cell lymphoma? So you really need to be able to understand if the patient has a history of recurrent self-healing papules and nodules. In contrast, primary cutaneous anaplastic large cell lymphoma, these patients will have solitary or localized nodules or tumors, no evidence of prior concurrent MF or another type of CTCL, no extracutaneous disease, so staging is negative. Histologic spectrum can include a cutaneous anaplastic large cell lymphoma similar to LYP. And the phenotype includes CLA positivity, EMA negativity, and ALK1 negativity. Now, if ALK1 is positive, you need to consider a systemic ALCL with secondary skin involvement. So if you look at the next row, you can see CLA negative, EMA positive, and ALK positive. This is defined as prior or concurrent extracutaneous involvement. The exception would be involvement of one regional lymph node basin, which has the same prognosis, prognosis as CALCL. These are often generalized skin lesions, and you're not going to have that history of recurrent self-healing papules and nodules. You're going to have this progressive, uh, persistent cutaneous involvement, and it's alcohol positive. Remember that. And of course, mycosis fungoides with large cell transformation or blastic transformation. So think about CD30 positivity in this entity as well. And histologically, it's an admixture with typical cerebriform cells, but sometimes it's indistinguishable from cutaneous anaplastic large cell lymphoma. These patients will often have prior concurrent patches and plaques. So many times, practically, the report is signed out as an atypical CD30 positive T cell infiltrate, C comment. And in the comment, we talk about the differential diagnosis, including these entities and how you really have to do clinical correlation. So if we do an ALK and it's negative, then we're kind of stuck between lymphomatoid papulosis, type C, CALCL, could be MF with blastic transformation. However, we really have to know, were there any precursor lesions that look like MF? Does the patient have a history of recurrent self-healing papules and nodules, or is it stagnant and even progressive? And so when the pathologist signs up the case like that, it's really up to the clinician to take the ball back 
it's in their court and really figure out what's going on with the patient, both clinically as well as radiology as well. And you can have CTCL with subcutaneous involvement. So subcutaneous paniculitis like T-cell lymphoma consists of infiltrates confined to the subcutis with characteristic rimming of individual fat cells by neoplastic T-cells. Deeply seated nodules and plaques mainly involving the legs and trunk. Characteristic CD3 positivity with CD4 negativity, CD8 positivity, CD56 negativity, and beta F1 T cell receptor positivity. There are other types of CTCL that can involve the subcutaneous infiltrates, and we will talk about those as well. So this is an overview from one of my colleagues, Dr. Gabriel Habermel, who is a board certified hematopathologist and dermatologist. dermatopathologist. Uh, he was actually my co-fellow at the Cleveland Clinic, and he developed this flow chart while we were in fellowship to teach the, the residents and the fellows, um, the derm residents and the path residents. And so he reiterated that there's an immunophenotypic approach and a pattern-based approach to classifying these entities. And so you can think about them being CD4 positive, CD8 positive, or CD30 positive in terms of the immunophenotype. And then pattern-based approach, you can think about epidermotropic, dermal mixed, or subcutaneous. And of course, there's also this EBV-based approach where if you have EBV positivity within these entities, you have to think about a whole nother set of, of diagnoses, which are usually associated with EBV. So I will not read through this entire list, but I will um, allow you to look at this for reference and compare and contrast other frameworks for classification. Primary cutaneous peripheral T-cell lymphoma includes some rare subtypes as well. And so you really have to exclude other specific entities and think about other provisional entities as well. And those include primary cutaneous gamma delta T-cell lymphoma, primary cutaneous aggressive CD8 positive epidermotropic cytotoxic T-cell lymphoma, primary cutaneous acral CD8 positive T-cell lymphoma, and primary cutaneous CD4 positive small medium T-cell lymphoproliferative disorder as we talked about. This is another table from Dr. Habermel. Uh, again, he's a board certified hematopathologist and board certified dermatopathologist who trained at the Cleveland Clinic. And he developed this very intricate algorithm to be able to use immunohistochemistry to help classify cutaneous T cell lymphomas. And at the time, he had developed this um, in 2018, actually, but still holds pretty true today where you can classify inflammatory dermatitides over here on the left, double negative CD4, CD8 entities, which are usually or typically CD56 positive, CD4 predominant entities, CD30 predominant entities, and CD8 predominant entities. So again, I won't go, this, go through this entire algorithm, but I will ask you to look at it on your own time by hitting the pause button and Kind of going through the mental framework of step-by-step -step IHC workup, and you can be able to see how most of these diagnoses are reachable just from an immunohistochemical framework. So we can take a couple for an example. So let's say you have a CD4 rich infiltrate, and you identify that it is CD3 rich, CD4 rich, but not very much uh, positivity for CD8. So that would be consistent with subtypes of mycosis fungoides. If you um, had PD1 positivity, you could think about the small medium lymphoproliferative disorder. If you had the ALK expression and you had a positivity for ALK, you could think about systemic or nodal anaplastic large cell lymphoma. But if it was ALK negative, you could think about the anaplastic large cell lymphoma that's primary cutaneous. You can think about certain types of LYP, including type C here. Another way you could do this was after you identified a CD3 or CD2 rich infiltrate, and the main neoplastic cells were not staining very strongly for CD4 or CD8, 
you could think about a primary cutaneous gamma delta T cell lymphoma. They can uncommonly have some CD8 positivity, and you can work up with cytotoxic markers such as TIA1, perforin, et cetera, and granzyme, and you would be able to see um, rimming around the subcutaneous fat. These entities may also have dermal or epidermal involvement with ulceration. We'll get into that. If you think about CD30 positive entities, it makes you think about all the LYP variants, which we will talk about as well. CD8 predominant brings you down an algorithm that ends with a subcutaneous paniculitis like T cell lymphoma or a primary cutaneous acral CD8 positive T cell lymphoma. You could think about a primary cutaneous aggressive epidermotropic CD8 positive T cell lymphoma. So th this is just a nice framework to be able to help organize your thoughts based on immunohistochemical analysis. But again, at the end of the day, you really have to go back to the clinical and look at multiple data points to see how is this patient presenting clinically as well as how are they progressing. It's important to just briefly touch upon the key stages in T-cell development differentiation. So you see that um, the cells will actually acquire certain markers such as Thi1 and CD44. Remember that you'll have double negative status of CD4, CD8, and then you'll acquire double positive status before either committing to a CD4 positive or a CD8 positive cell, which has expression of alpha beta TCR. There is an intermediate step here where you have double negative cells that acquire the gamma delta. And so if you think about a primary cutaneous gamma delta uh, neoplasm, predominantly you'll have most of these. Now they can have some expression of CD8 usually, but um, I won't say usually, but they can have some, but you might just see coexistence of CD8 positive cells within an infiltrate. And the true neoplastic cells are CD8 negative. Just as a reminder, NK cells are typically CD2, CD7, and CD56 positive. All right, so finally jumping into some histopathology here. So mycosis fungoides is the most common primary cutaneous T cell lymphoma. You have three major stages, patch, plaque, and tumor. The prognosis is good with patch stage, but it worsens with progression. These present as pink, tan, violaceous patches, plus or minus scale, and the bathing trunk distribution, as you can see here in this clinical image. And in the histopathologic image, you see a proliferation of, or infiltration rather, with epidermotropism of atypical lymphoid cells with prominent halos. Many of them are tagging along the basement membrane, the dermal epidermal junction, and this kind of pagetoid spread throughout the epidermis, as well as in the superficial dermis you see here. And oftentimes you will see fibrosis as well. Patch stage mycosis fungoides can have spongiosis around the infiltration. It can have interface dermatitis as well. But the key is that you're going to see atypical lymphocytes lining up along the dermal epidermal junction. These have enlarged dark nuclei with irregular contours and cleared cytoplasmic halos, as we showed you. You may see a collection in the epidermis of these atypical lymphocytes, and this is a so-called potriase microabscess. You can have a lichenoid infiltrate of atypical lymphocytes in the superficial dermis as well. Just another example of patch stage, you can see this epidermotropism of atypical lymphocytes with prominent halo, especially tagging along the dermal epidermal junction. You can see some areas of operated microabscesses as well. On higher power, you can really appreciate the prominent halos around these atypical lymphocytes. On immunohistochemistry, of course, there'll be CD3 positive. CD4 to CD8 ratio is usually greater than 4 to 1, but greater than 10 to 1 is even more supportive of the diagnosis. And you'll want to look for loss of CD7, CD5, or CD2.
Here's a clinical picture of plaque stage MF, again, from patches to plaque. So you can see um, mycosis fungoides is a great mimicker of other types of dermatoses. Some people might look at this and think about psoriasis on some of these thicker plaques with a silvery or micaceous scale. And in plaque stage, as you can imagine, the histopathology has more involvement of lymphocytes. So you can see it's more of a dermal-based process at this point kind of almost looks lichenoid from this power. You may or may not see a lot of epidermotropism as you go from patch stage to plaque stage. Moving on to tumor stage, as the name suggests, you have multiple tumoral areas here. So you can see these large nodular tumors that are starting to ulcerate. With tumor stage MF, you have the ability to potentially acquire CD30 positivity in greater than 25% of the large cells, and that would be so-called large cell transformation. Once you get to this point, you may lose really classic epidermotropism. And in fact, if you're seeing ulceration at that point, it's a moot point. You can't really see the epidermotropism because the epidermis is broken down, but a very dense dermal-based tumor in most cases. Here's another example of tumor stage MF. Now you can see in this example, it's predominantly these atypical lymphoid, almost epithelioid cells that are just kind of destroying the dermis, intercalating with just a few collagen bundles here and there. You can see that this entity actually doesn't have a lot of eosinophils, but as I said, I just saw a recent case that had tons and tons of eosinophils. So, um, look through the, any mixed infiltrate that you see and um, make sure that you're rolling out mycosis fungoides if it's presenting clinically with ulcerations and multiple foci. One of my residents was key in helping me make this diagnosis recently, um, Dr. Papik, and she keyed in on the fact that there was many ulcerated tumors and nodules in a patient. And despite the rich number of eosinophils, we were able to stain this biopsy and confirm the diagnosis, sent off for clonality, and it was positive for clonal population. So what are some other MF variants? We have hypopigmented MF, pagetoid reticulosis, folliculotropic MF, granulomatous slack skin, and Cesare syndrome, which we will cover in this talk. So hypopigmented MF, as implied by the name, you've got these scattered hypopigmented areas clinically. Some people may think that it resembles vitiligo. Darker skin children often present with this in adolescence. It's the most common type of CTCL in adolescence. And the most differentiating factor is it actually tends to be CD8 positive. So on histology, you see epidermotropic cells, but when you stain for them, it's actually CD8 rich instead of CD4 rich, interestingly. Pagetoid reticulosis, also known as Warringer Collip disease, presents on the distal extremities, usually has a good prognosis. The epidermis can be pretty acanthotic. You often see more epidermotropism than you're used to seeing in the other types of classic MF. These can be CD4 or CD8 positive. I like this picture here from Bologna that shows a keratin stain in panel C showing you just very thin remnants of where the epidermis was because it's completely taken over by the epidermotropic T cells. Folliculotropic MF presents on the head and neck of adult males typically. This unfortunately does have a worse prognosis compared to many of the other types in the indolent group. You see atypical lymphoid um, presence in the follicular epithelium. The epidermis is usually spared, and this makes it very difficult for topical therapies to have efficacy because most of the neoplastic cells are buried deep around the follicle. You can see follicular mucinosis around it, and people usually consider folliculotropic MF without the mucinosis and follicular mucinosis as somewhat separate entities that may respond to different treatments. Typically, this is coming more from the uh, 
cutaneous T-cell lymphoma clin clinical experts that suggest that um, patients may respond differently depending on if they have more of a follicular mucinosis presentation or if they have follicular tropic MF without a lot of mucin. Here's another set of images from Bologna really showing some of these folliculotropic lesions, almost looks pustular on top of a large erythematous plaque on this person's forehead. And you can see this very perifollicular lymphoid infiltration, some areas of kind of blown out white space around where the follicular osteo would be here. And it may not be possible to really appreciate mucin here. And in fact, it's Whenever I get these cases, I'll go ahead and do a mucin stain. So a colloidal iron stain or a mucicarmin stain to really look and see if I have uh, increased mucin amounts. Granulomas slack skin. As you can see here, this picture really highlights the slack skin in these patients. It's very rare, as we mentioned before. You see pendulous folds in the axilla and groin, it's slowly progressive. You see many multinucleated giant cells in the dermal infiltrate. And many of these giant cells can actually el eat elastic fibers. So this elastophagocytosis, as they call it. Here's a picture from Bologna just to show you the groin involvement. But again, this very slack skin appearance, loose atrophic skin, just kind of draping down. And in the dermis, you have this proliferation of lymphocytes there, but they are kind of in the background of these giant cells. And so... If you see this pattern of lymphoid rich giant cells, think about granulomatous slack skin. You can see a lot of giant cells in many different entities, but the thing that sets this apart is the number of lymphocytes. If you had more of a histiocytic rich process, then you could be thinking about other things, including granuloma annulari that has a lot of giant cells. You could be thinking about a palisaded granulomatous interstitial dermatitis, things of that nature. Here on the inset, you're highlighting um, just these um, on an elastic stain, some fragments of elastic fibers within the giant cells. So that elastophagocytosis process. Just another picture of the granuloma slack skin with multiple giant cells existing within a pool of lymphocytes. The number of lymphocytes is quite striking, so that would make you think about granuloma slack skin. Moving on to Cesare syndrome. Cesare syndrome typically occurs in older men. It develops from mycosis fungoides or de novo. Typically, it's considered a leukemic form of lymphoma. So it, it starts as a leukemia and then it involves the skin. So there is some controversy in the field. However, Recently, it seems that these are different entities. And so if, if someone has Cesare syndrome, they're urethrodermic, you can tend to think about this as a leukemia that's involving the skin. Now, this is in the more aggressive entity, so has a poor prognosis. These patients have urethroderma, intractable pruritus, lymphadenopathy. So the triad typically involves urethroderma, lymphadenopathy and presence of Cesare cells in the peripheral blood greater than 1000 per microliter. The T cells often show cerebriform nuclei, as you can see here. So this kind of looks like a brain depending on which angle you are looking at it, but you can see this kind of notch with these two bilobes. And so you can see it's quite larger than your erythrocyte. And if you do flow cytometry on these, these are going to be positive for CD3, CD4. Usually they're negative for CD8, CD7, and they show a loss of CD26. Cesare syndrome, as I said, presents with erythroderma, but also these patients have really impressive palmar keratoderma, as you can see here. The biopsies of uh, Cesare syndrome will just look very similar usually to mycosis fungoides, but the cells are much more monotonous. And in some cases, you may not actually see presence 
of the cells within the biopsy itself. Because again, this is a leukemic form of a T cell lymphoproliferative disorder. And so you really have to biopsy the, the, the high yield spots. So if you see a lesional spot, it's not just diffuse erythroma, but some lesional spot, maybe a, a plaque or a nodule, then you may be able to find more evidence of infiltration there. Adult T-cell leukemia lymphoma, as you remembered, I mentioned, this is the entity that's associated with HTLV-1. Up to 5% of those patients infected develop ATLL within 20 years. It's endemic to Japan, the Caribbean, Southeast U.S., and Central Africa. These patients present with osteolytic bone lesions, organomegaly, lymphadenopathy, and skin involvement in 50%. As with many CTCLs, they can present with an exfoliative rash and nodules. Here's a clinical picture in a patient with a darker uh, Fitzpatrick skin type. You see just kind of a diffuse papular um, eruption, bolusing of plaques. When you're looking at ATLL, you'll often see a dermal infiltrate histologically. Here is a blood smear that shows you this floret type distribution in contrast to the Cesare cell, which had more of a cereform um, architecture to the nuclei. Here you see this floret like architecture to the nucleus. So in the tissue, you may or may not see epidermotropism. These patients often have an immunoprofile that is reflective of CD3 positivity, CD4 positivity, and CD25 positivity and usually lack CDA positivity. So here is just a representative image to show you, you know, from this picture, you wouldn't be able to tell it's ATLL. You really have to know the clinical presentation. Is the patient from an endemic area? Do they have a peripheral blood smear that shows flower cells in the peripheral blood, et cetera? So you can just see this kind of superficial mid and deep dermal infiltrate of atypical lymphocytes. On higher power, you can see some areas that show epidermotropism, these potry microabscess-like areas. And you might be able to appreciate that some of the nuclei have a little bit of a floret or flower type pattern, but it, you know it would be difficult to be 100% sure based on the biopsy alone. So getting an HTLV1 status is going to be essential. Primary cutaneous CD4 positive small medium T cell lymphoproliferative disorder. This is technically not a lymphoma per the latest World Health Organization criteria. It often presents in adults as a solitary plaque nodule or tumor on the face, neck, and upper trunk. It has a very good prognosis and can spontaneously resolve. So not surprising it wouldn't necessarily be favorable to include in World Health Organization classification of lymphoma, but it is very important entity to know about because you see it and you're going to see it um, throughout your training. And so being prepared to think about it, you can save someone from the diagnosis of a dangerous lymphoma if you make the accurate diagnosis. So when I was in fellowship, we often stained for PD-1. That was kind of the, the classic marker that would stain this, but you have to take into account the clinical presentation as well. You can't just make the diagnosis based on one stain. So on the histology, you'll see diffuse or nodular dermal infiltrates, epidermal and sub-Q involvement can be rare, but you can have it. You often see many admixed B cells too. So it's not just purely T cell infiltration within the biopsy. You may or may not have a background of plasma cells. On immunohistochemistry, you're going to look for CD3, CD4 positive cells that are also PD-1 positive. This is kind of a follicular helper marker phenotype. You may see BF1 positivity as well. Typically, you will not see CD8 positivity. That's kind of what helps define the CD4 positive small medium T cell lymphoproliferative disorder. You probably will not see CD30 or other cytotoxic markers such as granzyme, TIA, and perforin. You might see occasional loss of CD7, although that's not as common. And Ideally, you would have a positive clonal study because, again, this is kind of a clonal proliferation process, but you may or may not. 
And while we're on the subject of clonal studies, clonal positivity is not proof of a lymphoma. And clonal negative studies are not proof that it's not a lymphoma. So you have to take everything into context. Yes, it can help push you along the spectrum of lymphoma versus not lymphoma, depending on clonality, but it's not 100%, just like any test in medicine. So um, place it within the context of the clinical and the histopathologic immunohistochemical findings as well. Here's a biopsy to show you an example of the CD4 positive small medium T cell lymphoproliferative disorder. And again, I mean, just by looking at it, you're not going to be able to say what it is. So you have to stain it. And so if you found that this was rich in CD3, CD4, and PD1, and it was a solitary papule on a patient, and you follow them along and it resolves, then it's probably what you have. You do clonal studies on this and it comes back positive for clonality, then that would be supportive. Um, you might find intermixed B cells in here as well. So these oftentimes in reality might be just signed out as reactive lymphoid hyperplasia. Um, many times they're going to, pathologists will just be descriptive because it's impossible to really say, but I want you to be aware that this is an entity and it is um, commonly tested as well. And what they'll probably ask you about is the PD-1 marker. Moving on to CD30 positive lymphoproliferative disorders this is probably one of my favorite groups of entities. It starts out as seeming complicated, but it's actually pretty simple when you review it a few times. So there's an algorithm for diagnosis and treatment of CTCL that are CD30 positive. So when, when you say CD30 positive lymphoproliferative disorders, it opens up three major types of diagnoses. You can have LYP, you can have ALCL, and you can have MF with large cell transformation that's CD30 positive. Now, if you start out knowing that you have a cutaneous CD30 positive lymphoproliferation, you want to go through your exclusion of CD30 positive large cell lymphoma, secondary to mycosis fungoides. If it is, treat as mycosis fungoides. And in fact, you can use anti CD30 targeted therapies such as brintuximab. You want to ask yourself, is it HIV associated or post-transplant lymphoma? Is it a benign skin disease with CD30 positive cells? Is it a skin manifestation of systemic ALCL? If that's the case, you need help from your hemato-oncologist. If you get to the point where you have um, a CD30 positive lymphoproliferative disorder and it's a solitary or localized lesion, and it's a cutaneous anaplastic large cell lymphoma. Again, it's not waxing and waning, so it's 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 away from the likelihood of lymphoma to papulosis. You can consider radiotherapy or excision, but if you've got multifocal lesions with no waxing and waning, it's probably CALCL. You can think about methotrexate radiotherapy. If you've got multifocal lesions and the clinical behavior is unknown, give it some time, maybe four to eight weeks to kind of see, is it waxing and waning? If it is waxing and waning, you can think about lymphomatoid papulosis, particularly type C, which usually resembles ALCL. You don't have to treat it. Again, this is because the side effects of many of the medicines that we use to treat these entities are actually worse than the entity itself. Methotrexate, even as low as five milligrams a week, has been shown to be effective in reducing the recurrence of these crops of ulceral nodules. So um, we have some patients that are on methotrexate and they're doing quite well, and they've been doing this for decades. These patients, though, have to be followed because of the risk of transformation to a lymphoma. So here's a classic codochrome to show you lymphomatoid papulosis. Now, of course, you can't see that these are recurring and uh, resolving, that they're waxing and waning. You can't see that from a picture, but this is the classic kind of ulcerative papule that you're going to see usually in lymphomatoid papulosis. They're recurrent crops of papular lesions that come and go, typically on the extremities, trunks, and buttocks. It's considered a lymphoproliferative disorder, but not a lymphoma per se. It's not malignant. That being said, it could eventually turn into a lymphoma and it may be associated with a lymphoma along the, down the line. So you have to follow these patients. 
I remember joking around with, with residents. Um, when I was a chief resident, we had a lot of residents that were just kind of coming in and saying, are you kidding me? There's so many lymphomatoid papuloses to know, but the more you review these, um, the more they're just going to be kind of second nature to remember. So type A, you should think about kind of should remind you of a Hodgkin lymphoma in terms of the morphology. So type A, typically you have wedge-shaped infiltration with scattered or small clusters, large, atypical, sometimes multinucleated or reed sternber like CD30 positive T cells. Now, of course, because I said it looks like Hodgkin lymphoma, your differential is going to include Hodgkin lymphoma. It may also include CALCL and tumor stage MF. But if you're having recurrent waxing and waning papules, and it looks like um, it's rich with Reed Sternberg CD30 positive cells, and you can think about type A OIP. The T cells are usually within an extensive inflammatory infiltrate composed of small lymphocytes, histiocytes, neutrophils, and or eosinophils, and the neutrophils may be scattered within the epidermis. Again, you're not going to make the diagnosis based on all of these other cell types. You're going to make the diagnosis based on the clinical behavior and the CD30 positivity, as well as the morphology of the cells. I often ask the residents, what type of LYP might be CD30 negative? The answer is type B. So type B can look a lot like MF, patch or plaque stage MF, but it's recurrent. It's coming and going. It might be CD30 positive, but it's the only one that's typically CD30 negative. On biopsy, you're going to see epidermotropism with a superficial perivascular to band like and sometimes wedge-shaped infiltrate of small to medium-sized atypical CD4, CD30 positive T cells. Uh, CD34 negative T cells in most cases though. So remember that. Type C are the uh, LYP groups that often look like CALCL. So cutaneous anaplastic large cell lymphoma and type C LYP are pretty much indistinguishable on biopsy. You have to know the clinical behavior. So type C is going to present with diffuse infiltrates of large clusters of large CD30 positive T cells with relatively few admixed inflammatory cells. Your differential diagnosis is always going to be CALCL and transformed mycosis fungoides if you're just looking at the biopsy. You need to know the clinical progression and multiple data points to know, is it waxing and waning or not? If you remember anything from this talk, it's going to have to be that diagnosis of LYP is critically reliant on the clinical behavior. Type D. Type D shows marked epidermotropism of atypical small to medium-sized CD8 positive, CD30 positive pleomorphic T cells. So the key to remember here is CD8 positivity. So CD8 positivity is unique with type D and type E. What separates type D and E is that the CD8 positive cells are angioinvasive and angiodestructive. You can see vascular occlusion in type E, you can see thrombi, you can see hemorrhage, extensive necrosis and ulceration. And type F should be the most, the easiest to remember because that's follicular. So type F shows perifollicular infiltrates with variable degree of folliculotropism of atypical CD30 positive cells. So type A looks like Hodgkin lymphoma, CD30 positive. Type B looks like MF, CD30 negative usually. Type C looks like ALCL, CD30 positive. Type D looks like CD8 positive epidermotropic process. Type E is angioinvasive and angiodestructive. It's also CD8 positive and CD30 positive. Type F, folliculotropic. And there's an interesting DUSP IRF4 type which shows extensive epidermotropism by weekly CD30 positive small to medium T cells with cerebriform nuclei. In this entity, you can see strongly CD30 positive medium sized to large blast cells in the dermis. Now this, I do not have a ton of experience with, but it is an entity that you should know about. So this DUSP IRF4 type has chromosomal rearrangements involving this locus on chromosome six, uh, specifically at the site P25.3, you can see localized skin lesions in older individuals. So 
if there is any question that it might be this entity, you definitely need molecular analysis on this. So just running through some of the types again, type a LYP shows wedge-shaped dermal infiltration of mixed cells with neutrophils, eosinophils, and small lymphocytes. You might see Reed Sternberg type cells that are CD34 positive. Sorry, CD30 positive. Here's another picture of type A LYP that shows the CD30 positivity and some of these Reed Sternberg like cells. Type B, as I said, mimics mycosis fungoides. You'll see an epidermotropic infiltrate. Often they're CD30 negative. Type C, you'll see sheets of large CD30 positive cells in the dermis. It mimics anaplastic large cell lymphoma. Type D mimics primary cutaneous aggressive epidermotropic CD8 positive T cell lymphoma. Again, remember CD8 positive in type D. So the immunoprofile of these cells are usually CD8, CD30, TIA, and granzyme positive. And type E mimics external NK T cell lymphoma nasal type because of the angioinvasiveness and the infiltration of CD8, CD30, TIA positive cells. However, this entity is CD56 and EBV negative. Moving on to primary cutaneous anaplastic large cell lymphoma. These are usually solitary or localized nodules, but they can be multifocal. Often um, you may have some uh, areas of spontaneous regression, but compared to LYP, it's much more persistent and progressive. Has a good prognosis. You might have nodal ALCL with secondary involvement, which is much worse. So doing an ALK, Analysis to see if you've got expression of overexpression of ALK will help separate a primary cutaneous anaplastic large cell lymphoma, which are typically ALK negative, from a secondary anaplastic large cell lymphoma, which involves the skin, which is much, much worse, and that usually is ALK positive. Primary cutaneous anaplastic large cell lymphoma presents histologically with dense mixed dermal infiltrate extending into the fat with many atypical large cells, so-called hallmark cells. In many cases, you may see greater than 75% of the lesional cells are CD30 positive. So you need to have a good majority of the cells that are CD30 positive to call this a primary cutaneous anaplastic large cell lymphoma. Here is histology just to show you these atypical lymphoid. In some cases, they may look epithelioid. They're so large and round neoplastic cells, many mitotic figures as well. Um, you can see nuclear pleomorphism throughout. And if you were to do the immunoprofile on this, if this were a primary cutaneous, it's more likely to be CD30 positive, ALK negative. What's the difference between this histologic picture and type C LYP? As I mentioned, and I want you to remember in many cases, you may not be able to tell. And so Type C LYP would be much more recurrent uh, with just waxing and waning papules and primary cutaneous anaplastic large cell lymphoma would be much more persistent. So what are the major distinguishing features of the CD30 positive primary cutaneous lymphoproliferative disorders? We kind of covered all of this. Uh, this is mainly here for your reference here to just help compare LYP versus AL. CL and borderline lesions. Some of the key uh, things that we talked about were the clinical behavior of LYP, cross the papules and nodules that contain spontane spontaneous regression. Whereas with ALCL, you have maybe only occasional partial regression, but these are going to be progressing, um, sticking around a lot more. When you're looking at the immunophenotype uh, between LYP and ALCL, you're not gonna see much difference. You're also not gonna see much difference in terms of genetics. And it, the histology is also very similar. So early lesions of LYP have superficial dermal perivascular infiltrates with neutrophils, maybe some atypical large scattered cells, concentrate around blood vessels, surrounded by other mixed inflammatory cells with fully developed lesions that show a wedge-shaped infiltrate. An ALCL may show 
Dense neural infiltrate, generally sparing the epidermis with some exocytosis of atypical lymphocytes possible. You might see confluent sheets of large atypical cells, inflammatory cells combined with periphery, except for numerous neutrophils. And so you might have a lot of neutrophils in ALCL as well. Borderline lesions include things that may show some large Reed, Reed Sturmer like cells. Of course, if you had something like that, you'd be thinking more of type A LYP. So these can be very confusing in real life, and you really have to kind of look at it at a case by case basis and place it within the clinical context. I'll leave this chart here for your self review. And finishing up with CD8 positive lymphoproliferative disorders, starting out with subcutaneous paniculitis like T cell lymphoma. This is a very tricky entity, a very tricky diagnosis. I've had several cases in my career where, you know, it's one thing to read the textbook, it's another thing to look at the actual presentation in real life and see how um, complicated these, these patients can be. Um, many patients are presenting like a lupus. I mean, uh, but immunophenotypically and cl clonality wise, it's presenting more like a subcutaneous paniculitis, like T cell lymphoma. They're responding to the same treatments as a subcutaneous lupus patient. And um, in many cases, there's thought to be some overlap between lupus paniculitis and subcutaneous paniculitis, like T cell lymphoma. It's also been um, increasingly well recognized that the subcutaneous pattern of primary gamma delta T cell lymphoma can look very similar histologically, but immunophenotypically has much more cytotoxic markers and typically uh, expresses more of the gamma delta TCR, which will help um, really kind of determine if the patient has more of a benign subcutaneous paniculitis like T cell lymphoma or more of a paniculitis gamma delta T cell lymphoma. Um, which have drastic differences in their clinical prognosis. So on this slide, you can see this kind of over on the right, looks more like it could be a paniculitis type process, maybe some indurated nodules here. On the left, you see more ulceration. And usually if you see ulceration, you'll think about the primary gamma delta type of um, cutaneous lymphoma. However, you can have ulceration, even in the subcutaneous paniculitis like T cell lymphoma, depending on if it is so destructive that it kind of causes a ischemia of the overlying epidermis. So subcutaneous paniculitis like T cell lymphoma usually presents on the lower extremities of adults, solitary multiple nodules and plaques. Usually it has an endolent course. It can be associated with HLH. However, I tend to think of HLH being more associated with the more severe subcutaneous gamma delta, primary cutaneous lymphomas. So you, you have to really look at the entire patient here. Um, we'll go over the histology and many times the, the things that you see in histology indicate that there could be a cytophagic paniculitis going on or some type of um, hemophagocytic lymphohistiocytosis. So um, we'll go over some examples so you can see. Some factoids about SPLTCL, histologically, you're going to see lobular and septal infiltration, restricted to subcutaneous fat with a lace-like pattern with this rimming, that's the buzzword, rimming of adipocytes, plus or minus beanbag cells. These are essentially macrophages with karyorectic debris. Immunohistochemically, you'll see CD8 positivity, BF1 positivity, alpha-beta TCR, Granzyme, TIA, and perforin can be positive in this as well. However, not as much or to the extent that you're going to see in gamma delta. And if you do a immunohistochemistry for TCR gamma, and many places actually do immunohistochemistry for TCR delta because it's been shown to be even cleaner than the TCR gamma. Um, and TCR gamma uh, many times can be expressed by some alpha beta cells as well, but usually um, TCR gamma are gonna be negative in this entity. Differential diagnosis includes lupus paniculitis. And 
If you are, if you have a clinical presentation that looks very similar to lupus paniculitis, then you really have to think about, um, you know, is this an overlap between SP, LTCL, or is this um, a purely subcutaneous paniculitis like T-cell lymphoma? And so if you have a positive clonality that typically, um, typically favors an SP, LTCL, however, it's not uh, 100%. And so sending out a molecular and anything that shows this rimming of the adipocytes is going to be important. Um, if you see lipomembranous change within the adipocytes, you might also think that uh, you're seeing more of a lupus paniculitis type picture. If you see more mucin, if you see um, perifollicular, uh, superficial and deep perifollicular inflammation or interface change, um, if you see some of the more typical features of lupus and this lupus paniculitis like presentation, then you can think that it's probably more along the lines of lupus. Now, um, prednisone and cyclosporin have been shown to be effective in treating both lupus paniculitis and subcutaneous paniculitis like T cell lymphoma. So there's probably some overlap there. Of course, the differential diagnosis may include extranodal NK T cell lymphoma. Um, that's mainly because you might do some stains that, that show that there's CD. 56 positivity in some of this, but typically that's more for the primary gamma delta T cell lymphomas, um, which you may uh, consider just based on the pattern and the depth of the infiltration that you might be dealing with something like that. However, if you do an EBV and that's negative, that's going to argue very strongly against external NK T cell lymphoma. So here is an example to show you this very dense, diffuse paniculitis like infiltration of lymphocytes. You can see individual adipocytes are highlighted and they're densely surrounded by lymphocytes. Here on the bottom left, you see an example of carrierectic debris within a histiocyte, a large histiocyte. This is kind of that beanbag cell. So here's just a table showing the differentiation between subcutaneous paniculitis like T cell lymphoma and lupus profundus. So in lupus profundus, you are more often going to see lymphoid follicles eosinophilic hyalinin change or this honeycombing or lipomembranous change, more mucin deposition and more epidermal changes that like atrophy, vacular interface change, follicular plugs, things that you would expect to see more in a lupus. These are typically going to be negative in the pure subcutaneous paniculitis like T cell lymphoma. Of course, you will and could see um, fat necrosis or histiocytes containing cellular debris in both entities. The diffuse infiltration of fat lobules by a typical medium-sized lymphocytes kind of characterizes both of these entities. And the rimming of adipocytes by the atypical cells are usually seen more often in subcutaneous lymphoma, but you can see that in lupus profundus. Erythrophagocytosis is more often seen in subcutaneous lymphoma, but you could see it in lupus profundus as well. The immunophenotypic variation is much more meaningful. So lupus profundus um, usually lacks the um, CD8. Uh, lupus profundus actually usually will show a presence of CD8 positive cells with negativity of CD56 and CD30. And the same thing with subcutaneous uh, paniculitis like T cell lymphoma. So these entities would be easily contrasted um, to some of the other entities like primary gamma delta T cell lymphoma, which usually only has sparse CD8 positivity. And we had a case recently that showed some sparse CD8 positivity, but most of the neoplastic cells were actually positive for cytotoxic markers and negative for CD30. CD56 is always useful to do because it would be more positive in the um, NK uh, CT, CTCL or the primary gamma delta CTCL in many cases. Speaking of the extranodal NKT cell lymphoma nasal type, anytime you see a codochrome of this, it's very striking because you've got these really aggressive ulcerations, nodules around the nose of patients. It affects the nasal skin cavity and palate, can affect other cutaneous sites. It's very aggressive. It's more endemic to Asia and Latin America. One of the hallmarks, and you have to know this, is that it's EBV associated. 
You can do some PCR clonality studies. If it's negative, it usually suggests an NK lineage. If it's positive, it usually suggests a T cell lineage. On histology, you'll see lymphocytes infiltrating the dermis and sub Q, plus or minus epidermis, angiocentric and angiodestructive infiltration and zonal necrosis. When you think about the immunohistochemistry, CD2 is usually positive as well as CD8, CD56, granzyme, TIA, perforin, and EBV. So remember, granzyme, TIA, and perforin are usually the cytotoxic markers you have to know about. You may have variable CD3. Um, it's not typically what's going to nail it. But again, CD3 could show you that it's more of a T-cell based, um, but CD56 is more of your NK marker. Another example of extranodal NK T-cell lymphoma nasal type, just diffuse infiltration of lymphocytes with some areas of zonal necrosis. Moving on to this entity of hydroa vaxiniform like T-cell lymphoma. This presents in children seen in Asia, Central and South America. Clinically, you'll see ulcerative uh, papula vesicles with scarring that affects the face and extremities. Very striking. On the biopsy, you'll see hydroa vaxiniform like T-cell lymphoma. You'll see epidermal ulceration, dermal and sub -Q infiltration. Positivity for CD3, 2, TIA, and EBV with variable CD8 and CD56 expression, plus or minus clonality. So again, don't rely on the clonality to make this diagnosis. Rely on the clinical context, rely on the clinical presentation. Um, does the patient have association with these endemic areas? Is it in the child? Is it EBV associated, et cetera? Primary cutaneous gamma delta T cell lymphoma. This is a challenging diagnosis. If the diagnosis is made, it typically, um, it's a scary diagnosis to make because it means that the patient has a very low chance to survive within the next five years. Uh, here's a picture from a recent article published that shows that not all primary cutaneous gamma delta T cell lymphomas are ulcerated. So many of the pictures you're gonna find are these areas of severe ulceration and severe nodular proliferations. And in fact, they can be a lot more deep seated and there are some epidermal and dermal subtypes as well as subcutaneous subtypes of primary cutaneous gamma delta T cell lymphoma. In fact, subcutaneous paniculitis like T cell lymphoma used to be divided into an alpha beta subtype and a gamma delta subtype because of this distribution in the sub Q only in many of these cases. So what sets these apart is that primary cutaneous gamma delta T cell lymphomas are very aggressive and rapidly progressive. However, the problem is, is that sometimes they exist in a more indolent state until they explode and then they become fatal. So these are very challenging um, cases. These often happen in adults. You can see all different types of morphologies, including multiple plaques, nodules, tumors on the anywhere on the body, mostly on the extremities, but it could be on the trunk. Uh, you can have mucosal involvement as well. So pretty much anything goes with this entity with um, primary cutaneous gamma delta C cell lymphoma. These cells, they don't really like to read the book and they don't like to follow the rules. So you can pretty much see anything in this entity. Here is a um, image histopathologically uh, from the just classic uh, database that shows rimming around the adipocytes with a lot of karyorectic carrier, debris, um, almost looks like leukocytoclasis in a way, uh, within these macrophages, these beanbag-like cells around single adipocytes, some areas of necrosis as well. So if the patient had predominantly a sub-Q pattern of this, then of course you're going to have to stain it and see, is this a cytotoxic heavy process and um, you know, what's the immunophenotype of this patient. So the histology on this, as we just reviewed, shows infiltration. It can just be in the sub-Q, but of course it can involve the epidermis and the dermis. It can involve all layers. You can see plus or minus necrosis. I mean, so chemistry shows CD2 positivity as well as CD3 positivity. Very rich expression of cytotoxic markers, such as granzyme, TIA, and perforant. 
TCR gamma and or delta expression very high. Uh, CD56 positivity in many of the neoplastic cells. And the key is, is that the TCR gamma delta is expressed and the beta F1 is not expressed in the majority of the lesional cells. CD4 is usually not expressed and CD8 may or may not be expressed in the lesional cells, but we shouldn't use CD8 to, to really make the diagnosis. Moving on to primary cutaneous aggressive epidermotropic CD8 positive T-cell lymphoma. This presents with patches, papules, nodules, and tumors. Clinically mimics gamma delta T-cell lymphoma. It's also aggressive and rapidly um, fatal. The histology shows marked epidermotropism, as the name it suggests. You can see lichenoid infiltration, plus or minus epidermal ulceration, subepidermal edema, acanthosis, hyperkeratosis, and angiodestruction. Immunohistochemically, you'll look for CD3 positivity, beta F1 positivity, CD8, TIA, granzyme, and perforin. It's usually negative for CD4 and CD5 with variable expression of CD2, 7, CD45, and CD30. The histology shows that predominant epidermotropic architecture, along with a very dense superficial and mid-dermal infiltration of these cells. And so just to finish up as a reminder, just kind of this overview to show you, there's an algorithm to classify the CTCLs. You have more common entities down to the rare entities, but keep in mind the diagnostic alg algorithm of how to approach this. Think about mycosis fungoides and its variants. Think about Cesare syndrome first. Those are gonna be the most common. And then start to progress down your CD30 positive algorithm. So make sure you do a CD30 positive or a CD30 stain to show is it positive or negative because that opens up a different set of diagnoses. And if you realize that you're dealing with a non-mycosis fungoides or a non cesare syndrome, a non-CD30 positive lymphoproliferative disorder, then you need to think of these other entities. And as you saw from this very brief lecture that... Um, it can be pretty complicated, and there's a lot of uh, things you have to take into account, not only just the clinical presentation and the way it's progressing, but the histologic and immunohistochemical phenotype, as well as molecular findings. Taking all that together in conjunction with your hematopathologist, dermatopathology working together to make the most accurate descriptive diagnosis and rank in order your differential diagnosis of what you prefer, what you think is more likely and what you think is less likely based on how the patient's presenting and be willing to uh, adapt to more clinical information. So the more clinical information you get about the patient, the more you're going to be able to kind of test your uh, hypothesis of what you uh, diagnose the patient with and uh, see if it's still holding true. Does it behave the way that uh, the most of the cases usually progress. And if, if not, um, close clinical follow-up, additional sampling, additional molecular testing is always going to be necessary to be able to help um, update any kind of diagno diagnostic considerations. The other thing is um, ask yourself, is the patient responding to treatment the way that you would expect them to as well? And so um, if patients are responding to the treatment, you may be on to something. If patients are not responding to the treatment the, the way that you would expect, then um, be willing to open up your your thoughts to other potential diagnoses. And keep in mind that many of these entities are extremely difficult to treat. And so we didn't focus a lot on the treatment aspect here uh, for the purpose of the uh, just the diagnostic and dermatopathology lecture. However, treatment is very difficult for these cases. And so um, as a dermatologist, you'll learn about all the different ways that you're gonna be trying to treat these. Many times with the mycosis fungoides and variants, we start out with topical therapies, some, in some cases, topical steroids, UV, um, UVB therapy, um, topical nitrogen mustard or Valclor. Um, you can think about retinoids such as acetretin, bexeritine. We didn't talk too much in detail about the staging, but the more advanced stage that you get, the more need for systemic treatment. So by the time that you advance to uh, greater than 10% involvement with maybe tumor involvement or lymph node involvement, uh, erythroderma or visceral involvement, you're going to need 
much more um, systemic agents. So vexerotine, retinoids, if it's CD30 positive, you can think about brintuximab, which is an anti-CD30 treatment. Um, there are other systemic chemotherapies that can treat more diffuse involvement. So your CHOP regimens, which are often going to include cyclophos cyclophosphamide and doxorubicin um, in, in conjunction with vincristine, prednisone as well. So getting your oncologist on board with these very advanced cases is going to be key. Total uh, beam electron therapy has been shown to, to be very effective for topical um, I mean, for skin limited disease. And there are some other interesting medications like uh, histone deacetylase inhibitors, varenostat that have been used. So um, the treatment, the treatment field out there is very complex. And um, you're really going to have to have close collaboration with oncology as you try to um, get the best outcomes for these patients. Well, thank you for your attention.